and welcome to this video. What? It's actually a podcast. And welcome to the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast. Where? Today. Tonight. It's kind of nighttime now. We're going to talk about something that um, is a little weird. And I, was, I didn't know if I should do a video about this or if I should do a podcast about this. But um, considering that this podcast will eventually be up on YouTube, I'm hoping that like it kind of just gets everywhere so we can talk about this. But basically, before we start, I just want to say, if you have oxygen in your lungs, five stars on iTunes, please. Yes, I appreciate it. You are awesome. And then let me hit the shout outs, because I don't want to leave those out so i want to give a big thank you to my folks over on the patreon so i want to give a big thank you to chase to michael to deborah to cedar to harry thank you guys so much for your support um for those of you in the youtube thank you crew i want to give a big thank you to patrick to brit to jh to jan and to alan Thank you guys for your support. It is appreciated. And then over in the Anarchy Crew, to the big swingers, I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Lisa, to Josh, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Tim J, and to Chill Baby. Thank you guys so much. And hopefully you guys all already went to the, the Endless Poem workshop that I did on friday which i think this will be out on saturday so that makes sense and then i want to give the biggest the biggest thank you to you know who you are yeah you know who you are the sdg over in the chat book of the month club the number one chat b thank you so much you guys are awesome poems about fucking go get it but yeah i just want to thank you guys um for all of that and hopefully you guys all went to the workshop the endless poem workshop because that was actually kind of a cool thing kind of came up out of nowhere if you're in the anarchy crew you've already if, if you even if you didn't show up to the thing you have access to the video of it so um definitely watch that to figure out how to do that thing because um, i think it's pretty fucking cool so i guess now we can oh actually no i do have one thing i want to clear up um in the episode i did where i was talking about the folly of judging your own poetry i was talking about how um really the people who i sent um winner of your mom sodomy prize for poetry to to find out like what their five favorite poems and their five least favorite poems. Um, what I also noticed, um, not only did really no one pick the same five poems as their favorite, no one picked the same five poems as their least favorite. So that doesn't really tell me hardly anything even on that end. Because what I was really hoping for, at least, is that there would be people going, these poems are garbage, these poems are shit, you know, whatever. Like, whether they think so or not. But, like, if a bunch of people were like, yeah, we don't like these, then that would be something. And so now what I'm thinking about, what I'm thinking about is that those first five and those last five at least had reactions. People had reactions to those poems. Whether they were good or bad, there were reactions. I don't know, maybe something emotional that took place. I'm hoping it was to a point where they were just like, ugh, no, I don't like this. And not like a, hmm. So what I'm thinking of doing is keeping the poems that were in the top five and in the bottom five and then getting rid of some of the stuff in the middle. Because I would rather, even if the poems are kind of bad to some people, well, and then again, like some people had poems in the bad side that other people had in the good end. So it's like, it really doesn't fucking matter. I just want to make sure there's poems in that book that generate some kind of visceral response. And if that means putting the poems in that weren't liked, then I should do that just as quickly as I put the ones in that people did like. You see what I'm saying? So just I wanted to clarify that little tidbit of info there. And with that said, on with the shizno. I wanted to talk to you about I had a kind of business opportunity that I was offering somebody. It was kind of like a partnership kind of thing. The response I got was written in a very clear and concise way, which is the only reason why I'm able to verbalize this to you. But it's something that people have been telling me my whole fucking life, and it's 
put this way. And I wanted to just make some shit clear, okay? And I think it really kind of ends up showing a lot about me and kind of behind the curtain. And also maybe about some of you, you know? Like you might be kind of going through the same kind of thing. So I just wanted to, it, it's, it's kind of a big deal creatively, especially when you want to collaborate with people. Okay, so let me read to you portions of this message I got. And I'm not going to say anyone's name. I'm not going to say what it's about or anything like that. And I'm going to take out any kind of information that would show who I am actually referring to here. Okay, so uh, this made me very happy and excited, but wouldn't want work like that to end in disappointment. Okay, and then this emailer continues and says, if Matt Wall, in quotes is a unit that measures productivity and efficiency, and one mat wall is peak efficiency, I am currently down around 0.16 mat walls. Okay? So, that sounds very strange and weird. And some of you might be going, what the fuck are you even talking about? But my whole life as far as being an artist and whether it was when I was doing music, when I was doing movies, writing serials to doing poetry or even just making YouTube videos or even podcast episodes. People always say to me, like, I don't know how you have the energy to do all of these things. You're constantly going, you're constantly doing stuff, and it's exhausting just to be around you. It's exhausting to hear you talk about the things that you do. And I completely get that and understand that. And if you are into all of that, like, shit about, like, what kind of person are you? Like, are you a, um, like, a reflector, um, a, a generator, a manifester? Um, and there's probably a couple other ones in there. But, and then there's the one that I am, which is a manifesting generator, okay? If you are into any of that stuff, by me telling you that I'm an MG, you know what the fuck I'm talking about, okay? And you're like, fuck, yeah, no, that's that's a bit much. You need to fucking take a step back. Like, most, like, generators can go and go and go, but then take some time off. Most manifestors, like, can go once, and then need like three days off. Um, and then like, I don't really know much about reflectors because there's not many reflectors in the population. Um, and then there's one that's even less than that. And so whatever all of that shit is, I don't even know what the fuck it falls into. Fucking Google it. I don't fucking know. I just had somebody fucking talk to me about this to try to explain why so many people have kind of come at me with the same thing that this person came at me with. And it's there's nothing wrong with it because all of us work in different ways and that's fine. And to be honest, I've never met anyone like me. I've met people who are kind of like me, who might have their fingers in a couple pies, but like it's not like me where it's like every appendage I have is in 17 pies at once and I have pie all over my face and I have no clothes on. And horrible things have happened to pies that have been underneath my torso and my lower regions. Ah, oh, that was a horrible analogy. I am. I apologize right now for it. So what I'm trying to say is, whenever I ask somebody to do something, like if I hit somebody up and ask them if they want to collaborate on something, if I hit them up and say, hey, would you be interested in like working on this movie with me? Do you want to start a band? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to um, do some work for my publishing company? Like blah, 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 blah. Whenever I ask this stuff, I want everyone to know that I never expect anyone to ever work at the same level I do, okay? And I'm not saying this to sound like conceited or thinking really highly of myself. This is more of a, a addiction, a compulsion. Like, I don't have choice. I don't have a choice to not be like this. I've been like this since I was a fucking kid. And it is high intensity, go, 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 24 hours a day. Like, as soon as I wake up, I start working. 
and I work until I can't keep my eyes open anymore and I go to sleep. And then I wake up and the first thing I do is put my glasses on, pick up my phone, start looking for emails and things I need to respond to while I'm making coffee. There is no stopping. Like, I stop because I have to. Like, when I just, I can't keep my eyes open anymore. This is just who I am. And I don't ever expect anyone who I approach for anything or who approaches me for anything. I never expect any of any of you to ever, like, be at the same level I am. Because honestly, it's fucking exhausting for me too. I would love to be able to be one of those people who can do something and then walk away for three days and not have to fucking worry about it and take a fucking nap. All of this shit sounds amazing. I would love to fucking do that. I just can't physically do it. Um, Blame it on my ADHD, baby. If you want to, you know, like whatever. Um, it, it It's just... It's always been like this. Like, when I was in bands, I was always writing songs and wanting to record new songs and plan tours and book shows and all this stuff. And everyone was always, like, giving me shit. Like, Jesus fucking Christ, dude. Like, how many songs do you expect us to learn? And, like, why are we fucking doing this? And it's like, why aren't we doing this? Like, what's the fucking point if we're not continually growing and moving and when i was younger i didn't understand i thought when people didn't work as hard as i was working that that meant that their heart wasn't into it and as i got older i realized that it has nothing to do with that just people work differently and the world needs everyone to work differently if everyone worked at the same space like at the same speed like no one would ever feel like they've accomplished anything because you're doing, like, the bare minimum of what everyone else in the world does. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. I'm not trying to come off, like, weird. What I'm wanting to actually do here is just let you guys know that I never expect anything out of anyone when it comes to that kind of shit. The second thing I want to talk about here is you knowing who you are and what your capabilities are... And where your boundaries need to be. Because a lot of people, especially artists, don't ever set boundaries up. Ever. Because they feel like if they ever say no to something, they're going to like blow their chance. They're going to lose that opportunity. Most artists have this thing where they begrudgingly say yes to everything. Because if they say no, it's like they're telling the universe to fuck off or something. And that's not what's happening. Just like... Everything that comes in front of you, just take some time and think about it. Think about what it would cost for you to go into that, like emotionally, physically, spiritually, the whole fucking thing, creatively, and find out if the pros and cons of you doing that thing is worth you doing. If it's not, don't fucking do it. If it is, then do it to the best of your ability. Do it to the fullest extent of how much you can actually physically and emotionally give you know what i'm saying because again everyone's different all right but honestly the working at 0.16 or 116th of matt walls that thing has been said to me not in that way before and the only reason why i was able to bring it up is because that made sense to me i know i'm fucking repeating myself here but it's important for this to sink in but again, boundaries. Like when I was making movies, I never, ever, ever said no to anything until the very end is when I started to say no. And then I just stopped getting work. And that was a good thing because if I kept making movies, I would have fucking killed myself, dude, or killed other people. That was kind of the way it was going. I was about to murder people. Doing all of those jobs I was doing for all of those different people was putting me, like, it. my health was at risk. Like, my stress was going through the roof. I had TMJ. Like, I was grinding my fucking teeth like crazy. My blood pressure was through the fucking roof. I was super overweight. Like, I was probably, I don't know, I, I want to say, like, maybe 80 pounds heavier than I am now, and I'm still overweight now, you know? But... Like, I just was not healthy. 
taking on all the shit that I took on, even though, like, it seemed like I could physically and, like, emotionally handle it, I couldn't. And anyone who knew me at that time, if they took the time to look at me, they would have known how fucking wrecked I was. And one of the things in that email was talking about, like, how they've been feeling, like, emotionally over the last year. And so I totally fucking get it. And it's important for you to understand your own body. Understand when your body is saying, you need to fucking stop or you need to fucking do something. You know, you can't. And maybe this is just me talking to me right now. You can't go 150 miles an hour all the time the rest of your life. Or can I? Like, that's the whole thing. Like, as soon as someone tells me I can't do something, I immediately, I'm like, oh, hold my beer. Like, we're going to fucking do this right now. So, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this was helpful to you at all. Knowing when to say no is really important. And the only person who is going to be able to tell you where that line is, is you. And the only way you're going to be able to understand when that line needs to be addressed is if you set boundaries up ahead of time. Like, I will not work more than eight hours a day on any project. I will not work more than five days a week on any project. I will not work on any project where I have to put my own money into it. I am an artist. I am a professional. Motherfuckers pay me and I do work. Like just things like that. And then like too, like one of the things that was driving me kind of crazy, like especially in the beginning of my film career, especially, is I was taking on any work I could get on any project just so I could get in good with producers. So, like, I would write a movie, I would direct a movie, I would help produce the movie, I would line produce the movie, and then if there wasn't enough money at the end of the day to hire an editor, I would then edit the movie. Oh, there's no money for the score? I will score the film. I will do the music for the film. Oh, you have another movie that needs editing? I'll do that too. Oh, like, you need someone to wash your dog and suck you off here like, apparently that's my job now as well you know i was just doing whatever the fuck jobs i could to get in good and it fucking a killed me and b showed all of these people not that i was a team player but that i could be taken advantage of so i was constantly getting shit work from all of these people and getting paid less and less and less because I was willing to fucking do it. Like, I never put up a fucking fight for anything. I mean, I did, but it was never like, I'm like, eh, I don't know, that, that's kind of too low of a price. I was always like, well, let's see what we can do. And as soon as, like, some producers found out that I was the let's see what we can do kind of thing, they knew that they could fucking, like, finagle me down to where I was working more than I had ever worked before and at the same time, getting paid less than I had ever been getting paid before to the point where I almost couldn't pay my bills and my rent. When I had been living high on the hog just months before that. You know what I'm saying? It's just like you need to know where your boundaries are. And they need to be stated loud and clear. And you have to know yourself and know how much you could handle and what you could take on. Okay? So, I don't know. Maybe this was helpful, maybe it wasn't, and maybe I'll add uh, another little bit on the end of this episode, something a little more uplifting or more writer-based or poetry-based or something like that, um, because this was kind of just like a creative pep talk for you. Here's the next part of this podcast. I did my, um, you know the like poet vlog thing where I like go for a walk and talk about a bunch of shit. It was so windy here um, when I filmed that the other day that I don't know if you can actually make out anything I was saying. So I figured I would just kind of go over everything I talked about there on here because I don't know if I'm ever going to put that out now. And it's a little chilly. It's, it's, a, it's a balmy like 46 degrees out 
the sun shining, but the wind blowing, and the wind is making it even colder. So, whatever. Winter time. <clears throat> and I know it's better here than it is everywhere else. Apologies. So, what I was talking about then was I got an email. And this is actually kind of funny because lately I've been getting more and more, I wouldn't say legal advice, like people are coming to me for legal advice, but they're asking me questions about um, kind of what they should do in contractual situations. And this is cool. It's a lot of fun for me. I mean, not to downplay the anxiety and stress you're going through, but it's interesting to be able to see what passes for a contract today and also what situations people get themselves in from not being really careful. I just want everyone to know, and the people who have come to me for advice, I'm not going to say who you are. I'm not going to give any illusion, okay, to who you can be. So please don't fret about that. I'm going to take the situation that one of you talked to me about and kind of explain it in a way where it's all right okay i don't know i'll shut up now okay so basically what's going on is somebody hit me up saying that a company is using their art without their permission and when they asked about it and said hey you're not allowed to do that they said well i think we are and gave them some ridiculous excuse then they mass produced the product. So with that said, now there's this whole other problem where A, the person did not give consent to this company to use their art. Second, now the company has a lot of product out with that art in it. And three, this person is not being compensated at all. So they asked me, what to do in this situation. Like, what my advice would be. I, I don't give legal advice. I can't. I'm not a lawyer. But I would say what I would do two different ways. Okay, how this would work out for me would be one part of me would want to get a lawyer and sue the company and sue the person who put the project together as well, okay? Because... Whether it is books or magazines or even film, you have a an editor or a filmmaker or something like that, a producer, and um, like with music, you have an artist and a producer and all this other stuff. And then you have the actual either record label, production company, or book publisher or magazine publisher. And then once you get past that, you have the actual distributors. And then once you get past that, you have the actual stores, okay? Now, you can make an argument to go after all of these people. That's not gonna work. But going after the first two, which would be the, we'll say, the project manager and the company that put the product out. Those are the first two things, and those are the most likely where you'd be able to get this sorted, you know? So if you go after these people and sue them, you know, some things are going to happen here. One, you will probably never work in that business again. I'm not saying that's 100%. I'm just saying that's probably what's going to happen. Because the second you bring a lawsuit against a company, that company is going to let other companies know, especially if they hear that you're doing something with another company. They will gladly call that company, especially if you cost them money. They will gladly call that company and say, hey, just so you know, so-and-so cost us thousands of dollars with a lawsuit. So just saying, because as much as companies want to put stuff out, they also want to put stuff out from people that aren't going to sue them, okay? Now, you can go, oh, well, shit. Like, what about, like, workers' rights and all this other shit and all that stuff? And yes, that's true. And you have a right to go after people who have fucked you to get what's yours. And I 100% believe in that. But I also know 
how a lot of these companies work, and I know fucking human nature. And the path of least resistance is the artist with the least amount of lawsuits. Okay? So, there's that. The second thing is threaten them with a lawsuit until they give you what you want. So if they are like, well, we put the movie out or we put the book out or we put the album out and there's nothing you can do about it. Go, okay, well, I'm going to sue you unless you give me blank, blank, blank and use that as a negotiation. And I always think it's smarter to try to leverage future work too. So if they're like, okay, well, we'll give you this percentage of the sales that come off of this go okay that's cool but i also want you to put out my next book and i want that deal right now and i want the deal to say this 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 and that and if you don't want to do that because i'm not asking for a lot but if you don't want to do that then we're going to go to court and we'll take care of this there okay so there's that the other thing you can do (laughs) so the other thing you can do is create more. And I know this sounds fucking stupid, but the more you create things, the more things you make, the more things that you're constantly doing, the less of a tragedy it is to your soul when something like this happens. Because instead of just having that one kid, your only child, you now run a uh, elementary school. Or something like that. You now have so many projects that you're not going to be too precious about any one of them. Okay? Now, I say this as someone who had that happen where there was a project of mine that meant so much to me. That, like, I couldn't see the forest through the trees. You know? I was, like, ready to, like, quit everything Because this one thing wasn't going my way. That is a horrible place to be in. And a horrible feeling. Because then you quit. And you end up doing the whole like. Oh I wonder what would have happened. If only I would have blah 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 blah. You know. So instead of doing that. And instead of like putting so much pressure on your own work. Just make a ton of stuff. And that way none of this is ever going to make you feel that down. Because. I'm going to let you guys in on something. You will eventually get fucked around by someone somewhere, somehow, over something, over one of your projects. It's bound to happen because it happens to everybody, you know? And we get to decide how we want that to affect us. And a lot of times, we just get so wrapped up and what we want that one project to do and what we want that one project to be and how we want that one project to be released and all this stuff that like all of that just like it it destroys everything because the art is in the making you know the art isn't in where you find that you know like if your whole goal And being an artist of any kind is to, like, be able to walk into Walmart and see it on the shelf. You know, maybe this isn't the right thing for you. Maybe you should, I don't know, come up with a really cool toilet brush, you know, that's different than all the other toilet brushes. And then you can go to Walmart and see your toilet brush, you know. When Barnes & Noble started closing stores and saying that they weren't going to be buying as many books from distributors a lot of people got pissed because they were like well my dream is to be able to walk into a barnes and noble and see my book on the shelf tough shit take your book into a barnes and noble put it on the shelf and take a fucking picture of it and then get the fuck out you know like dream sorted you know have bigger dreams if your dream is to see a book on a shelf, that that's a pretty shit dream. Like, I would hope that you would be like, I, my dream is to, like, know that there's, like, thousands of people reading my book and having it change their life. That's, that's a dream. A lot of this is about mindset. And you are going to get fucked depending on, like, the severity of the fucking is going to be based on your mindset and how much you let things bother you. Okay. In recap, you can sue, you can destroy your career, or you can threaten to sue and negotiate. 
um, and then still sue and walk away happy. Or you could just work out some sort of deal and not really give too much of a fuck and just know. Because I think some of you out there are like, this is my opus. Like, after I write this thing, I'm, I'm never going to be able to do anything else again. That's bullshit. I've had that thought 700 times. And I still come up with something better. So, like, be open to inspiration and be open to creating. But if you're sitting here saying, I will never be able to make anything better than this. It's self-sabotage, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you just fucked yourself. If you have any questions about your contract or anything like that that you would like me to go over with you, let me know. I would love to. Since this is a poetry podcast, I do want to read some poetry. So I want to read to you um, out of this book slash magazine and i'm gonna say something like back in the day like when like wormwood review was around and obviously this copy of stove piper here edited by mike daly this was released in when did this come out oh 1994 yeah so this came out in 1994 and this in it has Charles Bukowski, Neely Tchaikovsky, Steve Richmond, and Irving Stettner. And there's there's a lot more than that in here, but these are like the, the main people in here. And I wanted to read to you some Steve Richmond stuff because I've talked a great deal about Steve Richmond and talking about like the meat poets and how I really dig Steve Richmond because he was fucking nuts. And all this other shit. And the thing that's weird, I picked this up today and started flipping through it. It's been a while since I've flipped through it. And a lot of the stuff that his poems are about in here are about shit we've been talking about a lot lately. But I want you to notice something here, too. Okay, do you see how the pages are dark in the middle? This is what I was talking about, Wormwood Review. A lot of these magazines, and um, I guess apparently um, the paperback books that came out in the 90s did this too they would have different colored pages in the middle because the middle of the book was a chapbook of the featured author okay and so this right here all of this all of these pages right here this is a chapbook of steve richmond's and so this is let's see 53 to 95 yeah, this is like a good 40 page. And it's cool because the pages are black. If, you, if you're not watching the video version of this. And there's like artwork in here. That's kind of cool. Wait, wait. How do I get here to read? Oh, come on, you piece of garbage. Look at that. That's awesome. Oh, my God. Just, I love fucking monochrome stuff anyway. So, anyway. So, this um, chapbook is called The Poets Are All Liars by Steve Richmond with illustrations by Andy Jenkins. But one of the things that I talk about Steve Richmond is, I keep putting my hands in front of the microphone. One of the things I talk about Steve Richmond is he thought he was, and he might have been, but he was kind of, I want to say haunted. That's what it sounds like more. Um, but he would use the word possessed, um, I think, by these demons that would force him to write. And write about the things that they're doing and shit like that. And that was the majority of his work. There was also a lot of his work is called Gagaku. And what Gagaku is, and I, I'm probably saying that wrong, but it is a form of Japanese music. And he would play this music like on a record player. And when he would play it, the demons would show themselves to him kind of thing. Is, I think it's how the story works. So I'm going to read to you some of the stuff. But yeah, so a lot of the poems are just titled Gagaku. Gagaku. Maybe it's this one that will make the other 3.4 billion poems written in human history move down a notch. I snicker a bit to myself. I know I have the power to do it. I am full of everything superb and rancid. 
Superb, darn it. Why can't I write darn? Does it always have to be blank or blank or blank? This is the one that will do it. Move those 3.4 billion down a step. Okay, here's the next one. My discipline isn't as it should be. I'm one who'd rather let a few slip by without correction. A master doesn't do this. And some editors teach me a lesson. They print my poems exactly as I submit them. Typos and all. It's all right. A good 80% of my printed poems have no typos, whether by me or the editor or printer. 80% is enough for the freedom I gain by sacrificing the perfection of the 20%. So this one um, starts talking about his poetry, but also about the demons. So, Gagaku. Smoke too much, tobacco, crack... Cut down, easy to say, and crack is so ill-tasting at times, not so hard to do. I lie. Plato was right. I am a liar. The poets are all liars. He said, I know I should speak for myself, that somewhere there is a poet who doesn't fib. My demons? Signaling me now that they are not mine at all. That they belong to themselves that they're self-possessed. I took Henry Miller at his word. The artist should not marry, so I haven't. Sex is around and available for any artist worth his pepper. He will reject it more than accept it. Demons are now flushing some white tile toilet and the water is bluish. Must have an aroma pellet. Demons now juggle, still inside the tiny bathroom. Fruit. They juggle yellow delicious apples, green pears, yellow long 14-inch bananas, regular oranges. Now they juggle yellow and green and white tennis balls. Orange too. Eight or nine of them. This is classic. A fellow. Never knows his own poetry, the good from the bad, especially when he knows he does. I like that one. What is the use to do what has been done? In poetry making, I mean. Demons clap once for me and bow their slick hair. They look identical to sumo wrestlers. This one I love. I don't need is the title. I don't need the phonies. I read their bitter letter. I rejected their poems from my mag. They are editors too. Now they won't print me. Again. So the fuck what? I don't need bad poetry from the phonies. Uh, Gagaku. Someday I won't see my demons anymore and thus won't write of them anymore. Period. Damn. I want to do it forever. I want that demon. Bad word. Immortality. In actuality, I want to write of them forever and do what I do forever between my poem writing. Good meals on Main Street? Nope. They shake their face. Nope at me. I will die too. In a second or more. I don't like this fucking idea of dying. Me or anyone else. I don't enjoy it. The demons give me a crock tear expression. Facial. They don't give a fuck that I don't want to ever die. So that's a bit of Steve Richmond. Again, this is kind of later Steve Richmond stuff. This is stuff apparently written in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think his heyday was the late 60s, early 70s. But it's still really good stuff. I, I enjoy it a lot. So anyhow, um, that was just a taste of him. So I guess it's time for butt plugs. 
Now with the butt plugs. I want everyone out there to run over to my website, IHateMattWall.com, and make sure you sign up for my mailing list. Because if you're hearing this podcast now, that probably means that the crowdfunding campaign for winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry is already started, and there's not much time. So get over there and pick up your copy, your pre-order tier, and get whichever tier you want that has all the stuff, whether it's um, just the book, whether it's the um, all three of my paperbacks, poetry books, whether it's those and all of the audio books that um, come with those, or any of the chapbook packs. I'm going to have different packs for the chapbooks. So, like, if you want to get all my chapbooks that are on writing, you could get those with the book. If you want all of my chapbooks that take place in the desert, you could grab those. If you want all of my chapbooks that are, like, like prose and not poetry, you could grab those. If you want all the chapbooks, you could do that. You know, there's all sorts of different things. And there's going to be stickers and all sorts of other stuff, t-shirts, things like that that are extras that we can put together in there too. So um, make sure you take a look at that. If you want to do any mentorship with me, if you have any legal questions that you want to talk to me about, go to IHateMountWall.com slash mentorship, read through it and see kind of what it is. If it sounds good to you, send me an email at IHateMountWallGmail.com and tell me your story and I'll figure out if I could help you or not. Uh, if you would like to watch this podcast instead of just listening to it, you can go over to YouTube and links will be down below for this and um, join my members on YouTube. Um, you could join the Thank You Crew, the Anarchy Crew, um, the Chapbook of the Month Club, and get whatever I put out every month. Also, if you join the Anarchy Crew, you get over 100 videos and lessons, plus a weekly live stream. You get writing prompts. You get all sorts of stuff on top of just supporting me and being a part of everything else I'm doing here. And you also get to do stuff like what we are going to do tomorrow which had already happened so i won't tell you about it or i can tell you about it i mean where we all got together on zoom and did this thing called the endless poem where um you can write a chapbook in one sitting and from beginning to end and that's how we're gonna do it so hopefully everyone who showed up to that wrote a chapbook in an hour or two you know some of you might be disgusted that i even broached that topic but i did so suck it also, um, the next episode is going to be an interview with the amazing Alice Allen from the Poetry Says podcast. Okay? I know. I, I was as shocked as you when I found out. So um, be ready for that because it's dropping next week. Okay? Dropping it like it's warm. Okay? You know, just do the thing, guys. Keep buying my books. Type hard. Get your stuff out there. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.